So by default, the whole document, the style applies to each contained operation within that port type. Let's take a look at whether we gave it here. So for this binding, um, the style equals, okay, so this is just the syntax for this. Is there an example somewhere? Oh, we'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so it, it applies to every contained operation unless you want to specify it on a per operation basis, which you can do, which is normally not recommended. Right, so the transport attribute can be, you know, what what is the transport you actually want to use? So for HTTP or so so for SMTP. I think all the examples that we are going to show are going to use so for HTTP. In this particular case, we haven't done any SMTP examples here, but it's possible. And I've shown you some examples of uh, of SOAP messages using SMTP as well. Right. So at the operation level, you can actually pick as well, right? This is the SOAP binding level. It applies by default to all the operations. At the operation level, you can pick this as well. Uh, and you can say that it is uh, one of these two styles. The op operation itself is RPC oriented or document oriented, right? Um, and in the SOAP body, there is something called the use variable and the use variable will tell whether it is literally transmitted as XML or whether it is encoded in some form. And if so, what is the encoding style, right? Um, so all of this information is essentially used for creating an on-the-wire representation. And that looks different depending on what, you, uh, what are the choices that you are making in, in these different parts of the specification of the wisdom itself. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of this. I think it may be too much detail for now, but uh, you know, you, you have the, uh, the handouts which include this and we can come back and talk about it. So again, these are some examples. Here's a hello service. It's using RPC style with literal encoding, right? Um, so the port type is called a hello IF, whatever that IF stands for. Um, and then there, under that port type, there is a operation name is say hello, and it has uh, this parameter order. So there's an input message and there's an output message associated with this operation. So this is again implicit. It, nothing is explicit. We are not created uh, messages outside and then come back and included those messages. Uh, it is implicitly defined in this particular port type, right? And then here is the binding that I'm giving for this particular operation. Right. Um, so I'm going to use uh, SOAP over HTTP. The style is RPC, and the encoding is literal. That's what I'm I'm using here for both my uh, input as well as output. The encoding is literal, and I can. It gives me a lot of flexibility to pick up different encodings for the input versus output, and so on. I may not. In most cases, I don't use that flexibility. It's very rare that I would say you know encode it in one way going, encode it in a different way coming, and so on. But it's there. It's the, the flexibility is there. Right? No, it doesn't say that. RPC style is just saying request response. That's what that means. Uh, in RPC style, parameters are transferred in some order. Document style is the XML document is transmitted. That's what it means. So the parameters are encoded in a particular order and sent versus in a document style, it is just a document that has to be interpreted, the order is immaterial, it has to be interpreted on the other side appropriately. It, it may, if it, is comp if it is typed well, the order may not even be important. So in this particular case, what this service is doing is that um, it has two parameters, string and integer, it is going to concatenate it and return it back to you. So that's why that order is important because the concatenation will verify whether the string returned is a concatenation of the two strings that I sent. The string and the integer that I sent. <coughs> so this is a different uh, way of doing it. It's RPC uh, using literal as well, right? So this is an actual example message. So it's a say hello, and I'm giving two specific parameters, right? Uh, so the parameter order is going to be this. So string one is this. Uh, uh, so given the parameter order, the on the wire representation will have it in this particular order is what it's, it's uh, going to do when it reads this, right? So it had two parts to it and these are the two parts in the example message that I'm sending. Right? This is a document type, we have to write the password automatically. Pardon? If it is document 
Huh. We have to write the password. No, no. Most tools will automatically generate it. In fact, a lot of this stuff like you see today afternoon <coughs> is automatically generated. So there are two ways of actually creating web services, right? Um, if you were to do it, practically speaking, there are two ways of doing it. One is you have a Java class, right? Uh, at, the, at least this is with respect to something called JAXWS, which is a framework that Java provides for creating web services. You have a Java class and you annotate your Java class with uh, certain annotations that are provided for you, right? So you say that this class becomes a web service or this class does not become a web service. And in that also you can say that certain methods are exposed as uh, service methods, some are not exposed as service methods. Uh, so you provide all these annotations and then you press a button and magically the WSDL is generated for you. Right? You don't have to do anything. The whole wisdom would be generated. Now you can sit and they're all the defaults are used while generating this or you can customize that, that template that exists. So IDEs do a lot of this magic behind the scenes. But if you don't know what it is doing, you could land in some trouble at some point in time. Right? Because they use all these defaults. How do I customize the defaults? What does the customization mean? Then you have to know some of this stuff. Otherwise, there is no point in. The other way of, of course, creating a web service would be um, that you actually define the WSDL and IDEs uh, give you different tools for defining such a WSDL document and then it will, uh, it's top down. So it generates all the programming language classes needed to implement that web service. That's the other way. So either you start with an implementation and create a web service, this is, this would be typical for wrappering and stuff like that or you go the other way around. You create a WSDL from scratch and you generate the implementation. Um, so that's, I think we are going to show both of them today, is that right? So we'll, we'll show both of the ways of creating web services. Okay, so the, so the choices basically are this, your style and use uh, variables will have these choices, therefore you can make a bunch of combinations of this depending on whether you want to use RPG style or document style and encoded or literal styles. Okay, um, so this is an example of, uh, I mean not example, this is characterization of when you might want to use these different styles. So if you have procedure call, obviously you'll use RPC. Business documents can be sent via the document style. And a procedure call has certain semantics associated with it. The semantics are, it's an operation, a set of parameters coming in a particular order and I will interpret each one of those parameters in turn to be of a particular type. That's what the, the receiving side is going to think of it as, right? Um, so that's what I mean by procedure called semantics as opposed to I sent a document and somebody knows how to interpret the document. It can have things in any order but it has XML tags so I know how to uh, parse this and interpret different aspects of it. Um, so RPC has a method signature, document styles have schemas um, and so on. So this is some of the differences. RPC is synchronous in nature, document styles are asynchronous in nature. Um, RPC is typically within your company whereas document styles are used. Uh, outside company boundaries, organizational boundaries, right? And that has certain implications of the kind of network that you're going to run on and so on, right? You can still achieve a request response. The, I think the important point to take away is that you can still achieve a request response um, to uh, set up a web service in a request response mechanism using document styles. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that, right? It's just that the way that parameters get encoded on the wire look different, right? So if it is an RPC style, it would, it's assumed that it is a short response time kind of a scenario and therefore the way the parameters get encoded would have to have the order built into that in some way and so on and so forth. But in the case, you, I can still set up a web service that says takes an input message, returns an output message. It is uh, going to be equivalent to a request response scenario using document styles. Nothing to prevent you from doing that. Remember, we saw examples of both document style literal encoding as well as RPC style literal encoding for that my hello service, right? So this is not saying that RPC style is only used for request response and document style is not used for it. So you can do both, right? It's important to get that. Um, so the, the other binding, if you did not use HTTP over SOAP, Right? If you did not use SOAP over HTTP or SOAP over SMTP, the other binding, remember, was just the GET and POST binding. So it allows applications to interact with websites, essentially. Specify, uh, you know, whether you are going to use GET or POST, an address for the particular port that you are going to. 
So this is not used often, but it's useful to see an example of that. Um, so here is an example of a get and a form post returning some image, right? Um, so here the message M1 has three different parts to that, two strings and an int. Um, message M2 has an image, which is of type XSD binary, right? So the and then you are going to create an operation called O1 under a port type PT1 which has a, as an input message M1 and an output message M2. Right? Again, these are types of messages. They can be reused. Remember, that is why we say TNS colon. This is the TNS is the namespace for this, which is not written in this particular document. Right? So TNS colon M1 would refer to this message type and M2 to this message type. Um, so now I am creating a service uh, where the, uh, so it has a particular port, right? Um, and there is some binding B1, right? And the, uh, the address is this. Now, what is that binding B1 is specified down here, right? So I'm creating a service with three different ports with three different bindings. It's the same service, so abstract service is the same, right? Um, and they're all accessible, it turns out at the same URL, the address location is the same except that there are three different ways of contacting the service, right? So what is binding one? Um, is it's a get binding, right? I'm, I'm going to say that you will access it via an HTTP get. It has, uh, this, this is the way that you would actually send it the different uh, uh, requests, right? And it would be of, uh, the output would be of image slash GIF. It's, uh, you, you all heard of MIME uh, types, right? So this is common in HTTP, is common in your mailing uh, clients that you use and so on. So that's what we're going to use here as well. And so the output is going to be of a type image. And the input, which is the two, whatever, two strings and an integer is going to come here, right? Um, so this is another binding type B2, which is also of type get, right? Um, which is of type UR, the, an encoded URL as opposed to a URL replacement here. Uh, which is also going to return an output which is the same way, right? Uh, the same output that we had for the previous one. So the third binding, which is of type post, it's a, a different, uh, for, different from the first two in that this is uh, going to send some stuff within the message as well. So this is going to be, the, the input is going to be sent as if it were form data, right? So that's what uh, this would mean. It's a form encoded input and your all, the output remains the same in all the cases, all three cases, it doesn't matter. It is just depending on how you are going to send your input, you are going to use your get or post methods. In the case of post, you would encapsulate it within the message body itself as form data. In the first two cases, it is part of the referencing URI itself. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Any questions up till now? If you are not reasonably familiar with some of the material, well, reasonably in the sense, if you are not familiar with XML and you start looking at this huge number of XML documents, it is a little confusing and disconcerting. But if you do more of it, obviously it will change very fast. For writing a schema, given another alternative, uh, relax ng. Hmm. Similarly, is there way to alternate way to write a uh, service description? Um, I am not sure what this schema alternative is uh, no, no, no. that you are talking about. Relax engine is another uh, specification huh. for writing in a schema, XML schema. <coughs> but it, it results in an XML schema? Yes. Okay. Uh, Similarly, either in an alternate way, hmm. describe uh, this interface and operation type instead of using W3C standard WSG. No. The only interoperable way is this. Right. Visual, is the Visual is the only standard that exists. Um, I mean, you could come up with your own definition of this. It's not too hard to come up with such a definition yourself, which doesn't include all this flexibility, which is uh, targeted towards specifically the kind of applications you have in mind. But it won't be interoperable. If you put it out on the internet and say anybody access it, they won't know how to access it. You know, you won't, they won't have tools that will take Visual which would today take visual and generate client stuff, those tools won't exist, right? So those issues will come into play. The notion of having a standard is so that you can have interoperability amongst anybody, right? You put something out, anybody can understand. It's like English, right? So if you, if you all talk the same English, then we can understand each other, 
right? If, if I talk something different. But I have found some difference between the WSK hmm. for a service written in Java and hmm. the service written in .NET. The WSDL itself can't be different. How can that be different? The service implementations we don't care about. Who wrote the WSDL is the question. If we follow one style of that uh, programming, say I write the service and uh, let tool generate WSDL for me. So I have ah, the WSDL, I got the WSDL. Now that may not be conformant. Right. It's possible that if you use vendor specific tools, they will inject all kinds of nonsense into it. Um, that is, you you have to then not use the vendor, really. I mean, it comes down to that. Because, remember, if you want your consumer to be somebody who is not using that vendor's products, then you can't put out something that is proprietary to what that vendor is generating. It's as simple as that, right? So, it's, it's you, what you should really do is to go back to that vendor and say, hey, listen, you know, the wisdom that you're generating is non-compliant. Um, therefore, the, the, in fact, what will happen is that if it is non-compliant with respect to structure, whatever receives the wisdom will remember the first thing it will do is try to do schema validation, right? Which is a schema it will go to this, it says on top, right, of the wisdom document, here is the schema that this is conformant to. And if that is not a W3C schema, then probably it will junk it right then and there, right? Um, if, you, if you include some proprietary schema that you are uh, you are caching at some place, then the validation will take place because all the tool is doing is validation of the XML document with the schema that exists someplace. Right? Now, if that is a non-standard schema, the generation of the client stop code will not happen properly. It will, something will happen, so probably won't be correct. Um, so, that, that is a problem. This is a problem that has persisted for aeons. Right? Standards have emerged but vendors have said they'll become more competitive by defeating the standard in some way, right? Basically, what they do is they'll add one or two proprietary API. They will get you hooked on to using those API because they're convenience API. And once you're hooked on to it, you're stuck because you're becoming specific. Where you're, you're stuck to that vendor at that point. It won't be portable. The same thing will happen with, the same thing happened with Corba. Corba published a standard of what the interface definition language would look like what the API for the ORB should look like and so on. Now, every vendor who implemented that standard went and added one or two little APIs saying, oh, this is better to have, that's better to have. If I put this API, it will give me a competitive edge over the next vendor. People started using it and once you start using it, now I really can't take my code from here and put it into another vendor's container. It's not possible. Because the code expects these APIs that don't exist in the other vendor's container. That's the problem. Um, so, if, if it is, then there is a problem and you should complain to the vendor. That's, that's the best advice I have. Uh, no, it's, it's serious. It's a serious issue, right? Because the, the whole process, the, the whole premise that this is going to succeed in the world is that it will be interoperable. Everybody can consume everybody else's services. And if that gets defeated, what's the point? A vendor does it purpose, no question about it. Hey, hey, Microsoft wants everybody in the world to use Microsoft. Just like, you know, WebLogic would want everybody in the world to use WebLogic. It's true with any product out there, man. Right? That's the... Uh, so, uh, you just know that we not be in this Um, ontology is is capturing the relationship and the, the relationship of different concepts to each other. That's an ontology. What do I mean by this is, I'll give you an example. A car is an automobile. Right? This is a relationship. Something is a instance of something. So there is a specialization, generalization relationship that is happening here. Right? So I could have an ontology for vehicles that will start with the root as uh, some vehicle, everything is a vehicle, it can be a land vehicle or a sea vehicle, <coughs> it's a land vehicle, it can be a truck or a car or uh, SUV, uh, whatever, right? So I, this, this is an ontology of terms that I'm building up and these terms have a relationship between each other. Those relationships can be expressed and generalization, specialization is only one such relationship, there can be other relationships as well between terms, right? 
so it, it, that's that's just it. And if you go take a look at uh, WordNet, which is a, a ontology for the English language, right? So it captures the, the 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 word relationships in the English language. It may not be domain specific, so it may not cover technological terms that I have, right? Um, but it is all the generic English terms. WordNet is one such ontology that is out there that you can use. Right? Uh, like that, everybody can publish their own ontology. So, for example, uh, you know, the financial industry can publish an ontology having to do with financial terms. Loans, loan rates, prime lending rate. Uh, all of these are specific to the financial industry. What is prime lending rate? It is something that is fixed by the federal government as the lending rate that banks give to, give to other banks or RBI gives to the other banks. And the other banks will have a loan rate that is different than the prime lending rate. Right. So these are all terms that are specific to the financial industry. You can build an ontology of that, such terms in the financial industry and so on. Now the problem that comes there is that I can define my ontology and you can define your own ontology for the same domain and they may look different. So, there is a way by which you can bridge these ontologies. So, there are technologies that allow you to basically say these two terms in these two different ontologies are equivalent to each other or are they related in some way to each other. Now, I am creating bridges between two different ontologies that exist. Right? And once I create a bridge, uh, uh, so, so for example, when I say I create a web service that says I am looking for uh, or I am able to provide, let's say, orchids right i am going to deliver orchids now orchid is a kind of flower as it turns out right on the other hand somebody else is looking for a web service that will deliver flowers right now there is something has to sit in between and say wait a minute somebody is delivering orchids and you are looking for flowers it could well be that you can use this service because there is some relationship between orchids and flowers so it's not an exact match of what you're looking for but there is a different kind of a match that I can give you. Do you want it? Is the question that you will ask. Right? So there are four kinds of matches that are defined in semantic web services. There are plugin matches, subsumption matches and so on. That's why it's a complicated subject. But it's not an exact match, but here is a likely match. Do you want it? If so, I will grade this match in some way and give it to you. That is how ontological services will work. That's how ontology will work. And how will it establish the relationship that orchid is a flower? There exists some ontology out there that the matchmaker is going to go read that says that a orchid is a particular kind of flower. Right? That's that's how it's that's how things are used. Uh, and so the same thing comes with semantic web as well. When I search for terms, right now there's a literal search that is taking place. If I search for orchids, it will return orchids, whatever it has to do with orchids. Google or any search engine doesn't necessarily understand the fact that of, you know, orchid is a flower and therefore somebody who is selling uh, petunias might also be selling orchid so I might return that as a possible hit. Now to make that link you need semantic information which is uh, me metadata that is encoded about my site. Right? And that's, where, that's how you get the semantic web. Right? When I have semantic metadata that is encoded as part of my site information the search engine can become smarter now. That's the semantic web, right? Well, web 2.0 is not the semantic web. Uh, web 2.0 has a number of technologies. No definition of web 2.0. Mashup technologies is web 2.0. What is mashup technologies? So I have a website which has multiple parts. Each part is coming from a different service that is being provided somewhere. Possibly web services. My site is a composed site, in other words. That's mashups. That's that's not necessarily saying semantic web. Semantic web is a different notion. This is the notion of semantic web. Right? Sir, if you add an AI developer, hmm. and I, I know this with SOAP and this, they are basically, uh, SOA have got something to do with AI. Hmm. But in these two days, I'm going to make the connection of these concepts. Hmm. Right. Correct. And I've done some kind of some kind of connection to the external system. Right. And some data transformations. Right. But I couldn't actually relate. Okay. 
So we drew a diagram yesterday. Do you remember the diagram? We drew a fully connected graph, then we replaced it with the notion of a bus. So we'll have to go back to the diagram. So what is AI doing? AI is connecting different applications. That's what AI is, right? Enterprise application integration. You are integrating a billing system with an inventory system with something else system and so on and so forth. There are two ways of doing that. Every system is written in some proprietary API. There is no standard, right? So Siebel has its own API for CRM. A portal has its own API for billing. So on and so forth. Right? Each one of them may be written in a different programming language. Right? Because you int the human interacts with them through a UI, he doesn't realize how it is written. He doesn't even care how it is written. Right? The, the accounts department which is interacting with portal has a UI presented to them. A web UI or whatever UI. So they don't care about it. But it turns out that if this is Siebel, which is a CRM system, and this is portal, this may be, let's say portal was written in Java and this was written in C++. Right? Now, how do I make these two things talk to each other? I want Siebel data to get customer records from portal. Right? I made a billing entry in my system and I want that information to flow automatically to Siebel. How do I do that? That is where you use any number of EAI technologies. You build some kind of a bridge. Right? which will transform customer records sitting in portal to a form that can be accepted by Siebel, which is understood by Siebel and will also bridge this language interoperability issues, database schema issues, whatever issues there are. Right? Maybe they both have different database schemas and I have to do this translation and write it out to the other database. Right? Now, <clears throat> if this is okay for two applications. Fine, build a bridge, no problem. If I have a thousand applications, or 500 applications, even 100 applications, this becomes a very messy picture, right? Potentially, I'm going to have a 100 by 100 matrix which says which applications talk to which other applications, right? So I have application 1, 2, 3, whatever, right? And I want 2 to talk to 3, I want 2 to talk to 1, 2 to talk to 27, whatever, right? I'll form this matrix. Now I have to build point-to-point -point bridges that will do data transformations, that will do in order for Siebel to call some, some function in portal, I have to call an API written in a different language, written into whatever standard, it may not be remotable, God knows what the issues are. Right? So instead of this application to application bridge, we could have a bridge which is mapping from C to Siebel and application to be anything. No, but your data transformation is specific to the application, it has nothing to do with C++. So I have a customer record. However, Siebel represents the customer record is Siebel's problem, not C++'s issue. Right? Siebel may write it in any which way. How portal represents the customer record is what portal the company decided to do. It has nothing to do with the fact that Java was used. Right? So there are more com larger complications than just writing a generic language to language bridge. <laughs> it would be a nice thing. But even there, there are a myriad of languages. I could write my application in Perl and give you a nice UI. So you will write language to language bridges also are quite a large matrix. It's not very small. But it won't be as big as the application to application matrix. Right? So, and languages are also evolving. Versions are evolving. So I have to keep rewriting these bridges every time the language evolves a bit. Goes from one version to another. So that issue is there. Instead of doing this, building this graph, which can get complicated, what we are saying is that you basically do EAI in a way that will expose each one of these applications as a, in a standard way. And every application's API are exposed as a set of web services, in other words. Right? So any application wanting to talk to another application will know how to call it at least first thing because it is called as a web service the technology is now will not become a barrier the technology barrier goes away the barrier of data translation still remains it's not going to go away right so for that xml actually helps this is called an esb and what the esb does is you can apply xslt rules you can give xslt rules to this esb right instead of actually hand crafting a bridge I will use XML technologies, translate all the data from application 1 into XML, apply a certain set of XSLT rules that I have coded as opposed to a handcrafted bridge 
and that will transform data into other uh, other formats. Hmm. Sending the message to the sub uh, to the yeah. bank, right? You're sending it to a bank or EDI, huh? Supplier. There is a trading partner. Okay, so you're sending an EDI message to some trading partner. Right. Hmm. <coughs> right. XML technology is being used there? No. no. Huh. Okay. Fine. But still, I do believe that you know when we use this GUI, right. it is written so and so web services used. We normally, uh, we honestly do not have time to actually explore and understand what this UI is doing. Hmm. We only create, you know, uh, create a collaboration definition. Okay. Create a product. But we know that there are certain web services involved because hmm. it says you use a JMS with web services, you use getting the start web service. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm also not certain what this GUI is or what the tool that you're specifically using is. Uh, but is the question that is this amenable to, is EAI, uh, this kind of EAI that you're using amenable to using web services? Is that the question or? Um, I would have to look at the specific application myself. I, I don't know what is the specific application you're talking about. See, anything, even a JMS queue can be exposed as a web service. It's not like if I have an MQ series, I can expose it as a web service. So what? Is the question. Just exposing things as web services is not going to make me service oriented in nature. That is the other thing. Right? Even though web services are a specific instantiation of the service oriented architecture, it doesn't mean that if I stick three web services, I'm service oriented in nature. Not at all true, right? So the, the principles of service-oriented architectures of loose binding, I mean loose coupling, dynamic binding, all have to be used in building your, your systems. If you're not using those, you're not service-oriented. You may be using some web services, which is okay, right? Just using web services is not a guarantee of nirvana of any kind. It could complicate your life even further. It's very possible, right? Um, so, what the, the promise that this brings to the table, however, is precisely what I've just drawn here, is that instead of having a number of point-to-point -point interconnections that you're building with different applications, right, you would simplify this diagram in some way, right, and this, this would be what the simplified diagram would look like. That is the promise this brings to the table. You know what if you are already doing? If you have a point to point integration situation, I will, re I will seek to replace it with an enterprise service bus of some kind. I will seek to replace all these point to point uh, bridges that I have built. I will throw them away. Instead, I will build bridges that will talk the ESB language on one side all the time. Right? That is the, that's the promise this brings to the table. Now, this is what you should be looking to do in this scenario. Right now what you are doing is you are you're doing a specific point to point filter. You are building this filter for data coming from somewhere, converting to EDI in a specific format and then sending it to this provider. 
you are building one of these bridges imagine as an architect if you have to worry about a thousand of these bridges that's that's where i am coming from right if you had a thousand bridges to maintain it would be a nightmare right so we want to move away from that at that point in time if you, if you just like i said if you only have two applications in your company you are only going to have two applications in your company they are talking to each other forget web services forget all the stuff just let them talk make them talk to each other by any which way you can right a pull program dump data into a file read the file transform it into another file anything can be done it's a waste of time trying to invest in web services and other stuff so sir if we are not uh, finding a service from registry and then invoking huh because we are already doing the url oh that's it's okay it's not this oh partly <laughs> partly you are right um so if you are hard coding the use of a specific service all the time then you are not loosely coupled anymore you are still tightly coupled to that service right so neither are you dynamically bound <laughs> so uh, not not that's really not what this is meant to be then why why use web services you might as well use java or corba or something and call it you just want a remoting architecture many remoting architectures exist including dcom good solutions that have worked for a number of years so why use this no need the kind of impact the end user would feel is that all the all the humans were taken out of the loop the efficiencies to be gained would be passed on to the end user <laughs> is a standard thing right somebody was talking to me yesterday about a uh, registry of these numbers you were talking to me right uh, so they have this registry of numbers so if i don't want to be bothered with the 20 odd calls that i get every day from mark telemarketers trying to sell me some give me away give me money right everybody every day some bank calls me saying i have a loan for you 33 lakhs whatever so i don't want these calls i don't want any loans right so i register my number with this registry that these people have built then it takes 45 days for this to become effective why i want it to be effective like this everything can be automated I my argument is that any legal process can be automated. Now why is it taking 45 days? Some human is probably scanning it. I don't know why is it any nothing can take 45 days in computers unless you are processing uh, the the Mars landscape or something like that, which takes a very very large computers to process. Right? Possibility that proxy may raise or not. Registration needs to be physical. I can register on your behalf, and you don't want. You still want. So you 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 get authentication from me. So you ask me to authenticate myself somehow when I register. Ten days for authentication by the service provider, Alliance and Alliance. <laughs> That's the end user benefit. Right. <laughs> and, and then, uh, so. But then benefit to the service provider. Huh? No no no. If you want end user benefit, you take the provider out of the loop. same thing with services provisioning right if i sign up for uh, call forwarding it will take some number of days for them to provision maybe one day two days whatever but what i want is a scenario where i sign up on the web for call forwarding for my account and next minute call forwarding is working all the way you can register for don't call this but how we know you are the person authenticate me na how can you not authenticate me ask me for some authenticating information that you have how hard can that be It's not hard to do these things, right? So that we should do. Services are there inside the organization itself. Right. Then the directory services may discover and other things may not be required. Depends on the size of the organization. If you are going with a million employees, with thousand seven hundred applications spread over a hundred countries, you will need it. It's larger than most countries themselves. <laughs> so. <laughs> it depends on the size of the organization if you have two services if you have company with 20 employees hey the comp- uh, employee can shout across saying here is my service and that they can hook up to it right don't need it it just depends on your situation you got to uh, analyze every use case separately you know every case has to be studied separately uh, but if you are not doing dynamic search if you may not need to do dynamic search 
when do you need to do dynamic search when you know the service registry is getting updated constantly i may find something better tomorrow 